Hi everyone, I am the Sarcastic Sloth and welcome to my channel. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be looking at a condition called Fabry disease. Now, you may never have heard of Fabry disease and there's a good, very good reason for that. It's because it's very, very rare. In fact, one in 100,000 people are the ones who are actually diagnosed with it. Why would I think that I'm qualified to talk about this? Well, the answer is very simple, is I have Fabry disease. I've known about it since I was 21 and it's a hereditary condition. When I was going through YouTube, obviously we're in quarantine at the moment, it's pretty boring. For the, for the first time ever, I decided to type in Fabry disease into YouTube. I do have a primary doctor that deals with everything relating to my condition. I just get all my information straight from the horse's mouth really. And the only reason I feel like I had to make this video was because a lot of the videos that I was seeing, they're either very clinical, which obviously you would imagine that would be the case because well <laughs> it's a medical condition so it makes sense for that to be the case but then also in terms of from the points of view from people who have the condition themselves it was well let me put it this way there's a, a lot of sad piano or happy ukulele in the background if you get what i mean I thought what I would do is I would take one of the videos that's on here, it's called What is Fabry Disease? Uh, and that's on the channel Fabry Disease, so it's pretty straightforward if you need to look it up. When I was 21 and I found out, there was not a lot of information at all, there was virtually nothing. And the stuff that I did find was actually extremely bleak back then because there wasn't that much information on the subject at all, it's only been really found as a um, recognised condition. Well, we're talking just like a handful of decades, really. I'm not doing this for any kind of sympathy. I'm not asking for anything whatsoever. It's just that I'm, I'm basically doing this video. So if there's someone like myself, you know, a young boy or girl who's found out that they've uh, got Fabry disease and they type it into YouTube, I thought, well, maybe if there's a bit more of a human element to it and you can link it to someone who's a who's an actual person <laughs> as opposed to as opposed to a doctor because they're not real people are they? <laughs> also knowing that it's not the be all and end all it's not something where you find out about this condition and that's it you're written off i mean i certainly don't feel that way i mean don't get me wrong it's not a completely easy ride at the same time what i'll do is i'll basically go through this video and relate it to my story and we'll go from there okay let's crack on what is Fabry disease? Fabry disease is a next link lysosomal storage disorder. Mutations of the X chromosome result in deficiency of the lysosomal enzyme alpha-galactosidase A. Lysosomes function as the recycling centers of the cell. They contain digestive enzymes that break down substances into smaller compounds. Deficiency in this enzyme results in progressive accumulation of globotriosylceramide in lysosomes, leading to organ damage and premature death in men and women. A lot to unpack there if you don't know any of the medical terminology, and I'm not going to pretend like I do. So, what I would tend to say when I'm speaking to someone who, you know, is curious about it, I would say that basically your body is born devoid of the enzymes or producing any of the enzymes that you need to break down lactic acid and waste substances that the body produces and they basically takes the pressure off uh, of your internal system that's all i really say i don't really go into any further than that because if i was going to start quoting any of what has just been stated there then um, people look at you like they're a dog who's just been shown a card trick this disease causes progressive damage to different organs and tissues. As this is a rare disease, with such a wide range of symptoms, it is frequently misdiagnosed. I started getting symptoms when I was 11, and like I said earlier, I didn't find out about it until I was 21, so that's 10 years when, you know, we'll go through the symptoms later because there's a section in the video that uh, goes through them very specifically. But basically I was symptomatic for the 10 years and I would go to the GP and I'd get told that I could be a throat infection, it could be, <laughs> could be arthritis of some sort. It's one of those things where you can't necessarily hold it against your GP for not picking up on it straight off the bat because they, they won't know about it. I go for all of my main tests at the local hospital, but 
obviously the GP is just your your regular doctor's practice. If I go <laughs> if I go down there, then I know for a fact that they're looking it up on Google. So it's uh, it's not your everyday occurrence. It, re it really isn't. It's e it's easily confused. I'll put it that way. Genetic inheritance. As the condition is caused by a DNA mutation, it is a genetic disease and therefore hereditary. Fabry disease is a next linked disease, which means that transmission is linked to gender as follows. I got it from my mother, who got it from mother before her, and so on and so forth. So why was it only picked up with myself? As we're going to see in a little bit, it, it's only the males who are symptomatic from a young age. So all of the people on my mum's side of the family up until then, they've all been females. That's the only reason why it was picked up through myself and through picking it up through myself, I was then able to see that, of course, then my sister had it and then we looked at other relatives, we got some relatives in America, they had to be tested for it. We haven't got an especially big family on that side anyway. You know, it's one of those things where you find out one person has it, and then you'll find out many people have it. As family members may be affected, even if they don't have obvious symptoms, it is very important to perform pedigree analysis and test relatives for Fabry disease when a diagnosis of Fabry disease has been confirmed. We then had to test everyone on my mum's side of the family then, and then people were coming back who wouldn't have had any kind of symptoms, because again, I'm the only male from that side of the family. Fabry disease and women. In men, symptoms generally appear at an earlier age, are typically more severe, and progress more quickly than in women. Well, I knew something was weird. I didn't know there was something necessarily wrong with me, but I knew there would be this thing that comes up every now and again in terms of the symptoms from the age of 11. Women affected by Fabry disease normally become symptomatic when they are adults. The symptoms are less severe than in men, which is why female patients are often misdiagnosed. Signs and symptoms. Early symptoms of Fabry disease often appear in childhood and include acute pain in the extremities. So this is how I found out primarily that there was something amiss with myself growing up though. So what I would get and I, in terms of the pain in the extremities, how would I describe it to someone who's never had it? It's like your hands and feet are on fire, then you, you're getting sort of electrocuted intermittently then, so then your whole body would seize up. But like your hands are completely done. You're, you're completely cognizant. It's not like an epileptic fit or anything of that nature. You're still there. You can feel it all. That's the thing. See, that's what's so horrible about it. I mean, I literally, I literally wouldn't w wish it on my worst enemy. But what I will say is, and I'm not, I'm not a doctor, so I'm not telling you what to have. But obviously, you can consult your doctor and see if this is what you should be on. But my life changed in terms of these. I mean, I don't even get these kinds of pains anymore um, because I take carbamazepin or Tegretol, as it's also known as well. And what that is, basically, it's um, it, it, it's a painkiller, but only deals with like your nervous system pain. It's definitely worth looking into if you haven't already. If you have Fabrice and you already do take them, then you know what I'm talking about. It's night and day. It's absolutely night and day. But like I said, the pains themselves, I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. It's... Uh, yeah, yeah, it's something else. Fatigue. So fatigue isn't something that I usually get. What what what, what happens with me? Just because the way my brain works, you know, I stay up until stupid o'clock at night anyway. I sort of have a period where I'll, I'll go all out and then I'll burn out. It, it's it's not so much like a, like a steady fatigue that I've seen other people describe on YouTube when I when I was looking through this the other day. But what I will say is. Another form of treatment that I have is this thing called enzyme replacement treatment. So what that basically does is, as I described to you earlier, the enzymes that my body doesn't produce, you know, next to nothing of, I have infused into my system every two weeks. But because of this, the virus that shall not be named in 2020, when this, when it first broke out, obviously we can, we did, didn't have the nurses come to our house uh, for, I think it was, must have been six weeks because they didn't have their own safety procedures in place, you know, in terms of their PPE uh, and what have you. At first, I felt absolutely fine. And obviously, with this treatment, I've been on it for a number of years. It wasn't a case that I felt anything immediately. I probably still had residual in my system. And then it just got to a point where me and my mum both hit 
the same wall because we both have it at the same time uh, we both hit the same wall where we just had this fatigue and I tell you what I, I've never felt anything like it if I'm being honest it was it was it was bizarre it's sort of you're, you're there but you're not and you, you don't have the energy to do anything and and here's the, the other thing with that is my job before you know lockdown occurred I was like I was like a groundskeeper so that's a very physical job that's lifting a lot of heavy equipment that's running around all the time especially in the summer I'm used to doing very physical work and not getting tired as a result but here I was in lockdown and I was getting tired just from being in lockdown it was it was the craziest thing and then that's when we clicked and it was like oh we need to make sure that we get on um, our enzyme replacement treatment again as soon as possible because uh, quite frankly i mean obviously it's doing its job in terms of how our body regulates itself it's obviously helping us in a, in a much more physical way than maybe we thought because when you're on it you don't really notice anything different it's not like you take it and it's like popeye spinach and you go <laughs> And you're like, oh, hey! <laughs> if anything, immediately after you take it, you get pretty tired. Um, you end up like just napping for the rest of the day, and then the day after, you're ready to kick ass and take names. Tolerance of physical exertion. That I've, you know, apart from what I described in terms of the fatigue episode that I had recently, I don't personally feel that way in terms of physical exertion. You know, I mean, I actually, you know, I do weights and all of that kind of thing. Not to the point of a bodybuilder, but I skate, I surf, and I do, I do a lot of. I do a lot of things so that's not one that p personally hits me it affects everyone differently what might be happening to me might not be happening to another person who has Fabry disease as well hyperhidrosis so this is probably the most interesting albeit weirdest fact about this so up until yeah two 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 and a half years ago I didn't sweat like at all I think the closest I ever got to sweating is when I visited Florida one time when we went to Disney World and if you don't sweat there then I don't know where the hell you are gonna sweat I, I can't believe people actually live out there <laughs> it was so hot to me it was mind-bending and I didn't have the carbamazepine pills that I'm on now either so I was getting the pains in my hands and feet quite a lot just from the heat uh, the way I found out about that after 10 years of going back and forth to the doctor and having you know it could be a throat infection and blah 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 I started a job and I was two weeks into the job and I had to take about two to three weeks off due to the fabrics. I was getting the pains in my hands and my feet. Luckily, they were sound. They saw that I wasn't trying to try one on or anything of that nature, but I didn't really have anything to tell them about it apart from it's what this hands and feet thing that I get. Um, so I went to the doctor one more time and I said, look, this really isn't on. I, I need to know what's going on here. And because I'd seen her so many times, and I don't, I don't really blame her for this now, but at the time I was furious, um, but I almost got like a sh shoulder shrug. And what annoyed me about it was that it was like, it was like she weren't even curious. And I said, listen, I don't care who I see, I just need to see someone who knows more than you, okay? And she goes, well, I guess I could send you to a neurologist. So I go to this neurologist, he asked me a series of questions, some of which were, do you sweat? And I had to really think about it, and I was like, well, no, actually, I don't. I've, I've got very dry, smooth hands. In fact, whenever I'd shake someone's hand, I always be like, why the hell is everyone so bloody clammy? <laughs> now I obviously live that life now, and uh, quite frankly, you guys can keep it because I'm not into it. I'm sweating right now in my room. It's, uh, it's gross. I don't enjoy it one bit, but you know, I guess it means that the treatment is working. Oh, and another interesting fact, actually, I, I nearly forgot about then when, when I started sweating. I wore shorts every day, all year round, without fail. Like, it, it could be absolutely hammering it down with rain, doesn't matter, because I knew that in five minutes, as soon as I start walking, I'm going to be boiling anyway. In fact, <laughs> I would always carry a backpack with me because, like, say if I started off and it was it was winter, I'd have, like, a t-shirt, jumper, and a hoodie on. I know in five minutes I'm going to be taking off that hoodie. I know in probably ten minutes after that I'm going to be taking off that jumper and I'm walking around in, in the dead of winter in a t-shirt because, you know, you just get so unbelievably hot because you're not able to sweat and cool yourself down at all. Another funny little story, I was coming back from a mate's house, I was at a party, it was about one or two in the morning, and I got stopped by the police, because they found it was weird that I was wearing shorts in the middle, in the middle of January, when it was, uh, it was absolutely freezing, so uh, I don't know if there's many people who can say that they've been pulled over for wearing shorts, but I have got away with it though. 
gastrointestinal problems. Everybody poops. An angiokeratoma. I had to look up what that word meant when I first <laughs> when I first watched this video. I was like, what? What the hell is that? So this is sort of an add-on to the story of how I got diagnosed that I was saying previously um, in terms of the non-sweating. One of the other questions that he asked me was, do you have any red dots around around your waistline at all? As he's asking me these questions, so first off he says, do, do you sweat? I'm like, no, not that I'm aware of. And he's like, right, right, okay. Do you have any uh, dots around your belt line at all? I was like, I thought that was belt rash. <laughs> so all of these things were tying up in my head. I went from thinking I was totally normal and I've never been in the hospital previous to that. I, I didn't have anything wrong with me. I'd never broken a bone. So I thought up until this point, I was basically invincible. And then, you know, as a result, you have this kind of thing and you realize actually the human body is a bit of a bugger. It will uh, catch you by surprise when you least expect it. Absolutely. You know, trust and believe that. Patients with Fabry disease are also particularly affected by sudden changes in temperature or extreme temperatures. And so if it goes from like an extremely hot day and then maybe like a thunderstorm comes in, like if it's like particularly humid or something of that nature, that used to set off my pains quite a lot. Symptoms that can be present in a large proportion of patients with Fabry disease include stress and fever. There's a reason why I call myself the sarcastic sloth. I try to keep it as chilled as possible. Uh, partly as a result of this and then partly because I don't want to live my life in a stressed out way if I can possibly help it. I mean obviously you've got to recognise that stress does occur in life and it's going to happen with this but you know I just try and keep myself at, at as even a keel as I possibly can as it's possible for any human to, to do so under the circumstances that they're under. However, Fabry disease affects different organs which require specific treatment. Disease progression leads to a variety of systemic manifestations, including manifestations of the nervous system, kidneys, eyes, skin, gastrointestinal tract, and heart. So yeah, basically what happens is where every six months to keep a track on the condition itself, I'll go to the general hospital in the area and I'll have what I call my MOT. So I basically get all the different areas checked out. I then also just talk about how, how the condition is affecting me in my daily life. I mean, I've, I've been dealing with this for nigh on 10 years now. So it's not really something where, when I go in at that time anyway, I was their favorite guinea pig because I was like one of the youngest people that they had who had the symptoms that I had. After my first diagnosis, I had no idea that it was even like, yeah, I had the, you know, it's called Fabry disease, but I still didn't register until I went to the hospital. I walked in to the, the office and there was like seven doctors in there and the head doctor looked like Freud and that spanned me out because <laughs> I was like, oh, this is a serious thing. I can't just pick up some stuff at the pharmacy and then they're telling me I have to see them every six months and... <laughs> Like at the moment, I've gotten to a stage because of the treatment, the enzyme replacement treatment and the painkillers that I'm on and things of that nature and the fact that I live a pretty regular life in general. The sooner you become at peace with the fact that you have to do these things, then the easier the process gets. In addition to physical symptoms, many patients with Fabry disease also suffer from depression, which is caused by factors such as decreased quality of life. Also, patients often feel isolated and have to deal with a lack of understanding for their condition. It's a bit like a Je Jekyll and Hyde thing, especially when I used to go through the pains because it, it turns you into someone that you don't really like because you're always annoyed because your hands and feet are hurting in this way and you don't know how to convey that to anyone. No one really knows what you're going through. I've, never, I've only ever met one other person who isn't in my family who has it and that was a woman who was in her 70s. So I, I, I've never personally had anyone to relate to in relation, relation to it but then, like I said, I've always shied away from going to some kind of group session I don't like groups at the best of times. <laughs> That's nothing to do with the Fabry, so I'm just antisocial. Another thing I do to sort of, you know, have a bit more of a handle on it, I sort of turn it into a little bit of a joke at times, really. So when I was younger, when I first found out about it, I refer to it as my Fabrys because I wouldn't, I, I didn't like, I still don't like seeing the disease part, to be honest with you. And I still refer to it to this day as my Fabrys. What would happen is when I'd explain it to my friends, <laughs> explaining this weird uh, condition they'd think i was saying febreze like the spray so it got to a point 
and where they're just like, oh, you are there, mate? How's your Febreze? And I'll be like, oh, yeah, man, smells great. You know, I just turn it into a bit of a joke, really, because then at least if you are able to do that, then you sort of have a control over it as opposed to it controlling you. Maybe that's just me, I don't know. So if you're able to, you're not obviously downplaying it to for anyone else, but you know, when, when it's relating to yourself, call it what you like. You can call it supercalifragilisticexpialidocious if you like. Early diagnosis is therefore essential. Patients with Fabry disease can lead a normal life. It is important that patients describe all of their symptoms during medical visits. This includes telling their doctor how often their symptoms occur and how severe they are. That's an important one, actually. Don't tell doctors what you think they may or may not want to hear. Basically, you need to be completely upfront with your symptoms. When I go in for my, um, my MOTs, I have to do surveys, basically, on like the pains that I've been, you know, the pain at the worst throughout the, since the time that I've been there, pain at the least, how I feel on that day, you know, does it impede me from doing X, Y, and Z? You get the point. So just be upfront about that because you're not, you're not impressing anyone and you're not benefiting anyone. You're certainly not benefiting yourself. And that's what this is all about at the end of the day. Learning about Fabry disease can help patients gain a better understanding of their condition and how to manage it. The Fabry disease community can provide valuable support and information to patients and their families. But patients also need to be committed to looking after their health. All the above may enable patients with Fabry disease to lead a normal life. Very good uh, channel there, Fab Fabry Disease. So it does exactly what it says on the tent, really, doesn't it? And wrap, wrap up this video saying, if this has helped you in any uh, any kind of way, then certainly let me know if you've got any questions about Fabry Disease or how you know I've dealt with certain situations that maybe you're going through at the moment. Then cool, drop me a line, you know, on on my Twitter. I'll put it in the in the description. You put it in the put and you've comments that you have in the YouTube comments too. Um, like I said, I just wanted to do a video that was maybe a little bit more relatable where you had someone who's had it for X amount of time and is going to sort of talk to you about it unfiltered in a way. Anyone who hasn't got it, who's just a bit of a nosy beggar like me, then yeah, ask me questions too. The more people who know about it, the better. I don't really know how to wrap this video up, but just stay safe. If you've got any medical questions, then ask your doctor. No, you can't self-diagnose yourself with this for anyone who just thinks that, oh, I've seen some of the symptoms, so I think I might have it too. Go to a doctor, go to a neurologist and get the test done. It's a blood test. They'll figure it out. Yeah, hope, uh, hope everyone stays safe out there.